Hayden Place. Starring Lola Albright as Constance McKenzie, Ed Nelson as Michael Rossi, Mia Farrow as Allison McKenzie, Ryan O'Neill as Rodney Harrington, Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson, Tim O'Connor as Elliot Carson, Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington, Time housekeeper. For Stephen and Betty, this house has played an important role in their lives. It will continue to be important. Mother. I wish I'd known you were coming, Stephen. You should have phoned. Who's out there? Come in. for that floor if you don't answer. Your mother wasn't expecting us. No, she wasn't. And you didn't bring me here to meet her either. Right again. Stephen. Betty. Stop handling me. I'm trying to open up these doors for you. I can open my own doors, thank you. Well, then try that one. usually only opens out anyway. Your move. Mr. Payton will see you for a moment, Stephen. I'll be right back. I was just brewing some tea. Would you care for a cup, Miss Anderson? Yes, thank you. You've exposed your king, sir. Why did you bring her here? Miss Anderson? I wanted her to meet my mother. Pity you didn't learn the art of patience, Stephen. You might make a very interesting opponent. Why did you bring her here? Well, since it was common knowledge, I assumed you knew everything there was about Miss Anderson. May I? Personally, I think the hospital was harsh. All right, Stephen, you've made your point. You know something that I don't know. Now, tell me about Miss Anderson. She borrowed Stella Chernock's personnel records from the hospital. Now, there'll be a great help in, uh, what was the word you used, destroying her testimony. Well, she was caught putting them back. She lost her job. Fired? Politely. They asked her to resign. Well, let her cry on Leslie Harrington's shoulder. It's his son she helped. Well, she wants even less to do with him than she does you, sir. Doesn't like him? Should she? Bring her in. She's not in a very good mood, sir. I had enough of a battle trying to get her to meet my mother. Get her in here. Well, I'll try, sir. Betty? Mr. Payton would like to see you. Isn't it getting late, Steve? Yes, um, maybe another day, when he's more rested. Come here, Miss Anderson. I have something to say to you. That'll be all, Mrs. Corn.
thank you for helping my grandson. Why did you do it? The Chenna girl's record. I thought they might help Rodney's case. Why should you want to help Rodney? Don't harbor, Stephen. Go and drink some of your mother's tea. Why, Miss Anderson? Because I could. Come here. Mr. Payton, I'm not a dog fetching a bone, and I don't perform tricks on command. Weren't you taught to be polite to your elders? Only when they're polite to me. You're an extremely pretty girl. I know. Too pretty, really, for Peyton Place. Why aren't you in New York or on some other big city where there's the kind of excitement that all pretty girls like? I like it here. Big fish in a little pond? That's why you set your cap for my grandson? That depends on whom you talk to. There are rumors your grandson set his cap for me. What kind of a boy was Rodney while you were married to him? You weren't married long enough for me to find out. But you must have formed some opinion. Yes. What was it? It's none of your business. Look out for that chest set. Those chessmen were hand-carved in Mexico for my grandfather. Each figure is worth one hundred dollars. Does the uh, value improve your game? What do you think of Mr. Harrington? As little as possible. You didn't get a settlement from him, did you? I didn't ask for one. And the piker didn't offer one, did he? What do you think your little prime is worth? Which one? The only one I'm interested in. The stealing of those records. How much is it worth to you, Mr. Payton, to humiliate me? So, you resigned from the hospital. It was my choice, resign or be fired. You need a job. That's right. And you came here to beg one. I don't think I have anything you'd be interested in. Probably not. Do you like working in a hospital? No. Why not? I don't like sick people. <laughs> Neither do I. In the sideboard behind you, there's a decanter of brandy. If it wouldn't offend your independent spirit. What did you do in the hospital? Everything. Write letters, read get well cards, deliver pills, pick up dirty linen, and smile. They wouldn't let me operate. Know how to give a hypodemic? It's easy. You find a vein and push. Well, go ahead, Paul. Doctors won't let me have any, so I hide it from Mrs. Cord. They say it could kill me. Can I get you anything else, Mr. Payton? You're an impudent, arrogant. Come back here. I haven't finished yet. I think I want to leave, Stephen. You should have been fired a long time ago. I'm talking to you, do you hear me? Come back. Well, no, I didn't expect you to diagnose her over the telephone. It's just that I was hoping you may get a chance to come down here and talk to her yourself. Well, if it is possible. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I must be overtired. So I've noticed. Mike? When are you going to ease off a little? I thought that 
Once the Mackenzie girl came out of the coma. Well, I've been going home every night. With an armload of books. Yes, and after reading them all, I came up with no answers. There doesn't seem to be any particular pattern in this. She remembers one thing and forgets another, and both happen in the same day. She forgets her father, and she can remember her mother. She recalls that Norman Harrington is a friend of hers, and then thinks of Rodney as just a casual acquaintance. Well, I guess that's the end of that romance. Oh, Mike, I am sorry about her. I really am. Let's just call it a day, huh? Why do I always say the wrong thing? What I really wanted to say was... What I really wanted to say was... Can I buy you a hamburger, Doctor? Now, I know that you haven't eaten lunch, and you can disapprove of me over the mustard. And at least you'll have eaten. What do you say? No. But I'll buy you a hamburger. You're on. What are they doing with it? It's the one chance they got to wrap up the game. There's two out. The bases are loaded. It's the bottom of the ninth. What does he do? He hangs on a curve. So naturally, the guy just stands right there, waiting. Knocks it right out of the park, just like he did the time before. Hey, can we have two hamburgers? Uh, one rare. A two. Uh, well, both of them uh, rare. And I want two coffees, one with cream and sugar. Two. Uh, both with cream and sugar. Look, we'll, uh, we'll be over here. Unless you want to stay and listen to the ball game. <laughs> and what do they do with it? It's the one chance... Well, I'm going to have to start thinking about preparing Allison for Dr. Quist. She'll start thinking we're ganging up on her. Do we have to talk about Allison? No. Good. <laughs> you know me. I'm a little short on dedication. Well, would you rather we talk about baseball? Oh, no. Not if you're going to be a fanatic about it. Fanatic? Why fanatic? Why not involved or enthusiastic or... Dedicated. Or dedicated. Look, if you haven't tried the product, don't knock it. Mmm. I tried it. Once. <laughs> it was my first job at the Foley Medical Center. And I was going to make medical history. Maybe you think I didn't. What happened? Well, I was working with this uh, young resident doctor, Tommy Dixon, and uh, we were doing a vitamin study on white mice, you know, standard stuff. But we went about it like this was the future of American medicine. Night and day, day and night, white mice and black coffee around the clock. We even got that real look of dedication, you know, drawn cheeks and uh, long dark smudges around the eyes. I was just trying to picture you like that. Oh, that's easy. Just try to imagine a 24-year-old hag in a crumpled lab coat. <laughs> anyway, this one night, uh, Tommy Dixon had been up three nights running, and I'd only been up two. So I said to him, look, why don't you get some sleep, and I'll stay up with the mice. Man. <laughs> it was disaster. It was just after 12. I fell asleep. Well, that's understandable. Yes, except that uh, I left the door open to a cage that contained 20 white mice. Oh, no. Oh, yes. 20 vitamin-packed white mice running amok, do you know where? They made a right turn at the hospital corridor, and they ended up in the maternity wing. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing you know, this very young new mama comes oh, no. screaming down the hall, her nightgown flying out behind her. Nurse, nurse, there's a mouse in my bed. And the nurse, she could have been a double for Miss Cho. She says, impossible, nonsense. Next thing you know, she jumps on top of the charge desk. She's got a second mouse hanging onto her ankle. <laughs> well, how did you round them up? 
one at a time. <laughs> it took till seven the next morning. <laughs> We better get the hamburgers. What is a pretty little thing like me doing all by myself, playing the pinball machine on a cold fire in the fireplace night like this? Are you meeting somebody here, Stella? You know, if I had any space in my room, I'd rent this thing. Can I buy you a drink, Stella? Because if I score three million points, I become an ace jet fighter pilot, and I win three free games. What do you want, Stella? I'm not going to rent that thing. I think there's something indecent about scoring three million points. Come on, Stella, let me buy you a drink. Yes, I want a drink. A private drink. I'll be right back. I wanted to hear it from both of you. Now try to remember just exactly what was said. Well, I just told Mr. Fowler that I had lied to him before and that now I wanted to tell the truth. That I did see Joe the day he died. That's right. That's exactly what she said. Did he have someone take down with his statement? No. He asked you why you lied to him the first time. Yes. And how did you explain that? I just told him I was frightened. She started to cry. And I said, look, nobody wants to get mixed up in something like this. And then he said, did I know about the lie? Well, what could I say? Then we had to tell him that she told you about it, too. Nothing the matter with that? He didn't think much of it, either. He didn't believe her. He thought she was making up the whole bit looked at her with those codfish eyes of his and said, now, Rita, are you sure you're not fabricating this whole story? And then he said he could see how Rita might figure that saying Joe was angry the day he died would help Rodney's defense. Well, that was to be expected. I mean that he'd attack her story. Yes, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. But I'm going to have to, aren't I? It's such courage to go to the district attorney and admit you lied. You both handled it very well. Mr. Fowler's going to tear me apart, isn't he? The way he looked when I told him. And his voice was so cold. Whatever happens in the trial, I want you to know that when this is over, I'll help you in any way I can, Rita. Thank you. Excuse me. I promised the kid things you can't keep. She's got a lot of courage. I would have run fast and never come back. I'm not too proud of her, but that's what I would have done. What do you say I buy us a drink, Rita? Make it some other time. Stella's out there, and she's not in a very good mood. That's the best invitation I've had all day.
What were you doing back there, Stephen? <sighs> Selling pots and pans, magazine subscriptions, get a new suit to wear in court. <laughs> Scotch and water, Ada. It wasn't pots and pans you used to sell, it was nectar. And silk stockings. Mm. One pound of peanut brittle free with each three dollar purchase. Remember that? <laughs> Your poor mother probably had to work all day and make peanut brittle all night just so you had double breasted suit to wear to the high school dances. I made the peanut brittle. What are you doing, knocking free in <laughs> <laughs> Your peanut brittle was soggy. Your ties were faded. Your silk stockings. You never bought any silk stockings. You and I never did any business together, Stella. No, we never did. You were such a pathetic little figure dragging that funny suitcase around. Cardboard. Your father still owes me for a couple of times. I bet you know the exact amount. No, I don't. But I can look it up. I saved the sales receipts. Well, I didn't know you were a sentimentalist, among other things. Only about the important things. I've always tried hard. I wish I knew the right words to describe your character. Go ahead, take a stab at it. No, I don't think I should say some of the words. <laughs> oh, no, don't be modest. I don't think you pay much attention to what I said, Stephen. Now you got a point. But if I was your sticky-fingered girlfriend, would you pay attention? I bet that Betty Anderson isn't even mad at you for getting her fired. She probably loved playing girl spy. Because we know, don't we, Stephen? That you were the one who sent her to steal my personnel records? I mean, we're old friends. You know, we used to go to school together. And all you had to do was have the guts to look me in the eye and say to me, Stella, I'd like to know about your employment history. I would have told you everything you wanted to know. That would have been the honest thing to do. But honesty isn't a strong point in your character. It's your character that's going to be dissected when I put you on the witness stand. Every facet of your character is going to be examined and re-examined. Not mine. Yours. This is for the ladies' drinks also, Ada. continuing story of Peyton Place. It ever occurred to you that maybe I am expecting something from you? Stephen Cord tricked you into meeting Martin Payton. If Stephen tries to make me do something wrong, I'll handle it. Don't go to work for Martin Payton. What does some poolside Sherlock Holmes in Hollywood care about me? He doesn't have to care about you. He's looking out for himself. Mm -hmm. 